Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this another Lord's Day that thou hast given us all thy manifold blessings to us. We thank thee that thou hast set this day apart unto thy worship and our service and unto our eternal benefit that thou hast selected this day so that thy people might be blessed on this day, not only in the proclamation of thy word, but throughout the entire one day out of seven. We pray that thou wouldst therefore bless us this day, open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. We pray for the church. We pray that thou wouldst continue to raise up men to stand for the truth and against the lie. We pray that we would continue to be able to preach the word without any fear of persecution, which is going to be a very limited time. And we thank thee for this time because we are still able to do this. And we pray that thou wouldst further this and that thou wouldst multiply thy people as thou dost save thy people in the line of continued generations. We pray that thou wouldst now, through thy spirit, Open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are continuing to look at Hebrews 11, verse 32, which says, And what shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets? We're dealing at present as of last week, with the person Samuel, excuse me, Samson, the faith of Samson, and what we can learn from his faith. So we turn back to the portion of Scripture where this particular instance of faith in the person Samson is located. Let's turn to Judges chapter 13 and let us read. And the children of Israel did evil again. Once again we see the cyclical nature of this book that the children of Israel do evil. God delivers them into the hands of their enemies. They cry out to God and he sends them a deliverer. In this instance, in the person of Samson, did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me. And his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, 
Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee, until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why seekest thou after my name, seeing it is secret? So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord, and the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on, for it came to pass, when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar, and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die, because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering in our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things nor would us, as at this time, have told us such things as these. And the woman bare a son, and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtal. Last week we began looking at Samson, this yet another example of the faith which is mentioned in Hebrews 11. And I hope you're all just as mesmerized as I am in all of these particular instances of the faith of God's people. That though they are, that though this is the same faith, we have the same faith that they have, yet this faith is instanced in all of these particular individuals, different circumstances, different contexts, different times, and we said that, first of all, we dealt with the person Abel, as we like to review, as you all know. Abel, we said, was an excellent instance of justifying faith. I believe the title of the message at the time was, Abel to be justified. And then we dealt with the second personage, which was Enoch, and we titled that sermon, I believe, Enough to be Sanctified. Able to be justified, enough in the person of Enoch to be sanctified. And we said that Abel represented the doctrine of justification because he was caused to see the importance of the blood. He offered a bloody sacrifice, which is inextricably connected with the text and with this concept of justification, which is to say God revealed to him the same thing that he revealed in the Chinese characters, in the Chinese language, this character for righteousness. On the top is the word for me. On the bottom, excuse me, on the top is the word for lamb. On the bottom is the word for me. Righteousness, justification is the lamb, the blood of the lamb, not over my sins, but over me myself. And this concept of justification is a recurring theme throughout the entire Bible because justification is, this concept of justification by faith is the gospel itself. We noted that near the beginning of our pilgrimage in this chapter of of the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we noticed 
that this wonderful passage of Exodus eleven seven. That let's look at it again. Exodus eleven seven. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue and against man or beast that ye may know how that the Lord hath put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. The operative word we said is the word how. That ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And why is that word so important? Because of Psalm 7 verse 11. Which tells us that God, Psalm 7, verse 11, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. The New Testament expression of that same concept is found, we noted, in John 3, 36. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him and with respect to the Egyptians God did not suddenly become angry at them but this example is a perfect picture of what is going to transpire at the last day at the last judgment God is going to separate the sheep which are the Israelites from the goats the sheep which are the elect from the goats which are the reprobate how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Egypt. And the answer was the blood, which was representative of the blood of Christ, the blood of the doorpost, propitiated the death angel so that he killed none of those in the houses over which the blood was placed on the doorposts. And don't miss the concept of Election in this as well. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. God the Father has in the blood of Christ chosen us. He does not choose us outside the blood of Christ. We've been seeking to, to emphasize this especially as of late. Revelation 13, 8 calls Christ the Lamb which was slain from the very foundation of the world, which is, as we see, speaking of the doctrine of election. And Abel was given to see this concept of justification because this a concept of a blood sacrifice is the very essence of justification. How can God justify sinners? It is only through the propitiation of Christ. And so we are emphasizing, as of late, not only question 33 of the Shorter Catechism, Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed us and received by faith alone. But also, the expanded version of question 33, which I wrote out for all of us to memorize and get on that memorization because justification by faith is the very essence of the gospel itself. And we noted that Romans 10 verses 1 and 2 says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So the Apostle Paul is telling us they're not saved. He prays. He longs for the salvation of his people. And then he tells us why. For they have as though they have a zeal of God, it is not according to knowledge. It is not according to epignosco which means a precise understanding of the gospel. In other words, if you don't have a precise understanding of the gospel, you're in the same condition as the Israelites of his day. And so people frequently ask, 
or they think to themselves, when was it that I was, was saved? When was it that I became a Christian? And the answer is when God caused you to have a precise understanding of justification by faith. Not before then. So we emphasize this. It's my task to see that you have that precise. I can't give it to you. I can, by the grace of God, I can explain it as best I can. The two problems the man has. He's done those things which he ought not to have done by nature. He's left undone the things which he ought to have done. And Christ comes and solves both of those problems. He propitiates God's wrath because of our transgressions. He works out a perfect righteousness on our behalf because we have no righteousness. Though we love to say, do we not? How frequently you hear it. I just heard it, I think it was last night. Oh my goodness. Because you have no goodness. And then, lastly, what is the relationship between this faith, excuse me, this righteousness of Christ, this obedience unto death, and this working out of a perfect righteousness, what's the relationship between this and faith? That's the gospel. Through the faith which the Holy Spirit works in us, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. You can't even memorize the expanded version of justification and not be a Christian. But nobody who understands justification and this expanded version of justification is not a Christian. Everyone who understands this is a Christian. So the importance of all this. Last week we said that justification involves a change in status. Previously, our status was judged a criminal. And in justification, our status has been changed from judge to criminal to father to son. John 8, 44 tells us, Ye are of your father, the devil. We're born with the father, with our father not being God, but the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. But through the propitiation of Christ and the blood of Christ, we now have a new status. God's anger toward us because he's angry with the wicked every single day. God's anger toward us has been propitiated. And so, now, we have a new status which is no longer judged to criminal but father and son. One of the most amazing, beautiful, wonderful verses in scriptures, 1 John 3, 1. I hope you know what I'm talking about. Behold, don't you love the beholds in Scripture, many of which are being taken out in the new translations. They don't like behold. They don't like the wonder of the gospel. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we now should be called the sons. That we, who were previously the sons of the devil, should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. Exodus 4.22. Another wonderful passage. Exodus chapter 4 verse 22. Which says. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh. Thus saith the Lord. Israel is my son. Even my firstborn, we are the sons of God. We have a new status owing to this wonderful doctrine of justification. And this past week, we were reminded of it, were we not? If you're reading in the same, uh, according to the same program we are, in John chapter 13, let's look at that again. John chapter, I made some notes of that online. John chapter 13, excuse me, yeah, John chapter 13, verse 10. Jesus saith to him, to Peter, he that is washed 
and he doth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. He says that these people to whom he ref refers are clean every whit. That has to mean justification. You can't really believe that you are subjectively as clean as you can possibly be. Oh yes, it's referring to justification. Owing to the blood and righteousness of Christ, we are clean as Peter was. Every whit. Because through faith, Christ's obedience unto death, his propitiation and his obedience to the law are imputed to us. And so we set Abel, this example of faith, was an example of justifying faith. Able to be justified. And then we said Enoch, enough to be sanctified. Justification, a new objective status. Sanctification, we said, is not objective, it's subjective. A new subjective condition. We are different. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. And one thing that's really difficult to understand because of this Baptist influence which all of us have undergone, have experienced, is that when we are justified, get this in your mind, at the time of our justification, we are exactly the same person subjectively as we've always been. You've got to have that in your mind. It's difficult for you to grasp that because of Baptist influence. God accepts us because, um, well, the Baptist says God accepts you because of something good that you do. But justification is an objective declaration. You are declared to be righteous, though you yourself at that time are not subjectively righteous in any way, shape, or form. But sanctification occurs immediately upon justification. And our subjective condition through regeneration is immediately changed. One of my favorite hymns. I'm not opposed to hymns. I'm opposed to singing hymns in the worship of God. Simply because why would we sing anything else but the most excellent? Why would we offer to God anything but the most excellent? And that is the songbook of the church, which are the songs. But one of my favorite hymns, Rock of Ages. The words go like this. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from whose riven side which flowed. And of course, of course, they've changed the words uh, to from whose wounded side which flowed, showing their ignorance because um, if I asked you the question, if this were not a sermon, I would ask you the question. At the time that Christ's side was pierced, was he still alive? And the answer is a resounding no. How can you wound, therefore, a dead person? You can't. From whose riven side which flowed, it was pierced. And out flowed blood and let the water and the blood, blood and water. And so, the reason we are spending as much time on these two doctrines is because of the all importance of them and the relationship between the two as we've been dealing with in Galatians 5 most recently Luther is reminding of this all importance of these two concepts faith and hope that's what we're dealing with faith and justification hope and sanctification your regeneration is as it were a down payment of what you have to look forward to. He that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it, shall continue to perform it until its final realization. And from another standpoint, these two doctrines are important because of the two enemies that we have. 
the enemy on the right and the enemy on the left. The enemy on the right is legalism and justification destroys this concept. Your understanding of justification completely obliterates legalism. Legalism. Um, last week we said that we said that this concept of justification destroys legalism because legalism is the idea that God will accept you on the basis of something that you do, including believing the gospel. But justification tells us that doing is the result of being, and you are by nature the very opposite of what God demands of you, and therefore you can produce nothing which is pleasing in his sight. We said that legalism is a false concept of strength, therefore. You are by nature the essence of weakness. For when we were without strength, Romans 5, 9 tells us, we had no strength whatsoever. Christ died for the ungodly. Or 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect from the start in weakness. You're the essence of weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And so in justification, the justified person realizes his total and utter weakness and by the grace of God casts himself on the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope, we said, comes through total despair. Strength comes from this realization of our total weakness. And then we said, Enoch is a perfect, just as Abel was a perfect picture of justification, Enoch is a perfect picture of sanctification. We are justified by the faith of Christ, which means faith in Christ, and we are sanctified by this same faith. We pointed out and spent quite a bit of time on this. That we don't have two different kinds of faith. Justifying faith is the same faith as sanctifying faith. Justified by faith, sanctified by faith. Justification, we just said, is a change of status. An objective, punctiliar, at one particular time, we don't continue to be justified. An objective change of status from judge to criminal to that of father to son. Sanctification, on the other hand, is a subjective change of condition. Justification, we said, is past tense salvation. I have been saved. I have been justified. I have been saved from the guilt of sin. You see that? You see the importance that we point this out. Guilt has nothing to do with feelings. It does in our society. Oh, I have a lot of guilt. That means he feels guilty. That's not guilt. Guilt is an objective liability to punishment. So I have been saved from the guilt of sin. Justification, past tense. And sanctification is present Continuous tense. I am being saved from the power and pollution of sin. Justification past in salvation. I have been saved from the guilt of sin. Sanctification present continuous tense. Salvation. I am being saved from the power and pollution of sin. We said justification is acceptance of you on behalf of God. Sanctification is living in light of that acceptance. Meditate on that. Justification is sonship. Remember that? You were of your father, the devil. Now he hath given us power, authority to become the sons of God. That's justification. Sanctification is living in light of this sonship. Justification is the death knell, we said, of legalism because God's wrath was not merely on your sins. God's wrath was on you yourself. Your actions 
we said, are important, but your actions are only important with regard to justification insofar as they are a manifestation of what you yourself are. That's the death knell of legalism because legalism once, once again says that God will accept me on the basis of something, anything that I do. But you cannot do in that condition in which you were born. You can do nothing but sin. We must be justified by the propitiation of the blood of Christ. So he that is no longer, there is therefore now no condemnation to them for whom Christ propitiated the wrath of God by his blood. So let the water and the blood from whose riven side which flow be of sin the double cure. Save me from its guilt justification, and power, sanctification. So justification is the blood of Christ which flowed from his pierced side and sanctification is the water which flowed out. Justification in the blood is an objective declaration. Sanctification is the water is a subjective change in our condition before God. So, just as we said, Abel is the death knell to legalism. Enoch, a picture of sanctification, is the death knell to our other enemy on the left. Antinomianism. We said antinomianism, just as legalism is a false concept of sin, of strength, antinomianism is a false concept of weakness. Oh, the subtlety of the devil. Do you see that? If he can't get you with the false concept of strength, and just as soon as he begins to cause you, the Holy Spirit begins to cause you to realize that this legalism is a false concept of strength. He wants to push you over into a false concept of weakness. Without the Holy Spirit's effectual working in you, you would never be delivered. I hope you can see that because of the subtlety of the devil. If you're not glorying in your strength, you're glorying in your weakness. The one is legalism, the other is antinomianism. I recently put a meme up which said, the only thing worse than fake news is fake good news. There it is. Legalism, fake good news. Antinomianism, fake good news. Glorying in your strength is legalism. And so the gospel must show you that your strength is weakness. Everything that you considered would recommend you to God was itself a reason that he will never receive you. Justification. Glorying in your strength is legalism which justification annihilates. And on the other hand, the enemy on the left is antinomianism, which is a glorying in weakness, a false concept of weakness. The gospel must show that you have no weakness. And I hope you're immediately thinking when I say that, the gospel must show you have no weakness. Didn't you just say that we are the essence of weakness? Yes, I did. So think this through. The gospel must show that you have no weakness because antinomianism is a false sense of weakness. True strength is a love of the law which condemns the legalist's false strength is false he sets up a false standard for righteousness. I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't dance. Love of the law also condemns antinomianism because his false sense of weakness is just so. A false sense of weakness because true a true sense of weakness is to be given an understanding of what God demands of you. And that he should demand this of you. And you are uncomfortable. 
for not being able to provide that which he demands of you in the gospel. The law shows you, in other words, that you cannot keep his commandments. But at one and the same time, it is a love for the law, a desire in you to keep his commandments, which desire is produced in you by the Holy Spirit. That's a true concept of weakness. Back to John chapter 13, verse 10. Don't you love it how all this fits together? We're dealing in Galatians 5, 5. Same thing we're talking about in Hebrews 11. We're looking at this week, John chapter 13. Same exact concept, concept of Galatians 5, 5 and Hebrews 11. Read it once again. Jesus said to him, John 13, 10. He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. So, he that is washed. Let's say, for example, you take a shower in the morning and then you walk down a dusty trail. Only thing you need to do is wash your feet off. That's what we're talking about. And feet represent sanctification. Your walk. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We walk by faith, not by sight. Sanctification. Our walk. Walk presupposes a certain direction, as we said before, walk presupposes progress. Dying more and more in the sin, living more and more in the righteousness. And so what did, Pe what, did Peter, what did Peter say? No, you will not wash me. Um, Peter said that in verse 8, thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. This major influence in the uh, antinomianism of our day, which is growing by leaps and bounds. This pastor made a statement in a recent sermon. I do not have any personal holiness. In fact, I don't want any. So Enoch, a picture of sanctification, was not only justified, but Enoch walked with God. He's a perfect picture of sanctification. Abel, perfect picture of justification. And the same faith that Abel had, Enoch had. We said that this faith, though it's the same faith, has two different functions. Luther told us that doctrine conceives faith. This doctrine, the first half of the epistles, referring to justification, it conceives faith. Analysis, as we looked at was two weeks ago, uh, the um, outline of what it means to preach, three uh, different aspects of preaching. First of all is the analysis of the text, the words, the meaning of the words, the context, the syntax produces. And then secondly, antithesis. Analysis, antithesis. Not only do you say what the truth is, but what it is not which conceives faith. And then sanctification refers to this concept of exhortation. Exhortation conceives hope. Luther tells us, through exhortation, when we teach, this is, this is what really just recently occurred to me, and that is this. Try to get a hold of this because it is so important. When we teach, was, I've always wondered uh, how this works out, that you teach doctrine and you don't always say, therefore believe. But it's, uh, it, it's subconsciously there, is it not? In other words, what I, mean by, what I mean is this. Whenever we teach total depravity, what we're saying at the same time is not only that you are utterly indisposed to all good, utterly disabled to all good, made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, we're also saying, one is, believe this! This is the faith of the saints. This is the faith of the church. See that? You cannot, as Luther tells us, you cannot separate these two. You can, for the sake of discussion, you can distinguish between justification and sanctification between justifying faith and sanctifying faith. But you cannot separate them. 
So, and we looked at Hebrews. Let's look at it again. Hebrews 11, 1. Perfect example. of I mean, The very first verse of the chapter we're dealing with tells us this thing from the outset. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see it? The substance of things, the doctrine and the hope. See? Doctrine conceives faith and exhortation conceives hope. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. How can you hope for something that you don't understand? It's an impossibility. And this understanding also leads to the faith which inevitably ends in our final glorification. Which is to say, from another standpoint, see how many different standpoints we're looking at this, so that you can understand this most important concept. From another standpoint, you cannot separate faith from trust. You see it? See it? The faith, the doctrine, what you believe with trust, you can't separate the two. A person always trusts that to which he ascends. I was bringing this point out in our family devotions this week. You're looking at a guy. Your enemy is over there, 15 feet away from you. He's holding a gun. Your enemy. If you believe there are no bullets in that gun, will you be afraid? Not in the least. You see it? See what we're talking about? But if you believe there are bullets, you will be afraid. See that? Is it because, what did I just prove? I just proved that a person always trusts that to which he ascends. That's what we're talking about. When we speak of faith and trust, when we speak of justifying faith, sanctifying faith, when we speak of the fact that doctrine conceives faith and exhortation conceives hope, John 8, 31 and 30 says exactly the same thing. Then said Jesus to those Jews, John 8, 31 and 32. You want to turn to it. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word, see that? If you really trust it, then you're my, he didn't say you'll continue to be my disciples. He says if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. And if you don't continue, you were never there in the first place. In other words, if justification, this is what we're saying, if justification doesn't lead to sanctification, you never were justified. Faith without works, see? Doctrine, which does not lead to practice, first half of the epistles, which does not lead to the second half of the epistles, the middle of which is therefore the doctrine, analysis, and antithesis leading to exhortation, therefore, I beseech you, Paul says. Therefore, based on the doctrine, brethren, by the mercies, the entire doctrine is the mercy of God. There is no mercy. There is no mercy in your mind without total, complete, and utter depravity. Let that sink in. Without believing yourself to be as bad as you can possibly be, there, give him an inch. To, give a man an inch of self righteousness. He'll be the best person. In, in three seconds, he'll be the best person who's ever lived. If you don't believe that, you don't know yourself. I beseech you, therefore, by the entire body of divinity, which is the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living dead person, because you no longer, henceforth, not living to themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Last week we began to look at this new instance of the faith which God gives to all his elect, this person of Samson. And we said that Samson was interesting from one standpoint because of his many weaknesses, which are right there front and center for everybody to see. Related to his weaknesses. And another thing which we didn't mention is that, think about this. 
don't we tend to think that the greatness of Samson was is to be seen in his strength? Huh? Strongest man in the Bible. Have you ever thought of that, about this? What do you, if you saw, if you really saw Samson, do you think he would look like a Mister? You no, I don't think he would look like a Mister Universe. Why? Because that would cause you to think that his strength was was on the outside. No, I think he looked like an ordinary person. But we tend to think that Samson's greatness is found in his strength. No, his greatness was found in his weakness. Hence, we are shown these weaknesses in Samson. Back to last week, we entitled the message... Samson and perspective. Samson's weakness ended up being in strength because God caused him to, to see, as he does to every single one of us, his weakness. And how do I know that? Samson wasn't a... Uh, Samson had, as we said last week, Samson had many weaknesses. It's right there for all of us to see. And yet, Samson wasn't a weak person. Got to know that. You got to grab a hold of that. Hebrews 11, 32 tells us that. He was a mighty man of faith. And we said also, that's easy to see in the person of Samson. This proper perspective. Samson and perspective. Because we're told, without any doubt or cavil, that he was a mighty man of faith. And so we look back at the entire story of Samson and we have a proper perspective. We see everything in light of the fact that he was a mighty man of faith. We see his weaknesses in that light. And so, um, our job is more difficult because we, because Christians don't wear name tags. You don't see one go, oh, he says he's a Christian because he's got a Christian name tag. That guy doesn't have one, so he's not a Christian. Our job is much more difficult because Christians don't wear name tags. We have to figure it out. And this isn't busy work. This is, this is necessary work. Because, number one, you have to place yourself under the preaching of the word. Whose words are you going to place yourself under? See that? You see how difficult it is? And important at the same time. Absolutely necessary. You will listen to people. But perspective determines who, whose teaching you will place yourself under. Secondly, you will fellowship with people. You think fellowship isn't important? Iron sharpening iron. You will fellowship with people. And the people with whom you fellowship are going to have a great influence on you. So the importance is the perspective that we saw last week. Many, if not most, if not all, those who have left us, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued. And have you noticed, our enemies, they can't point out, I've given them, given them what is the gospel? Listen to this sermon. They can't point out any aspect of that sermon, which is not biblical. Those who've left us are drifting into, if they're not already in the middle of it, Antinomianism. Perspective. Number one. The position that we that the person has in question on sin. A person can say that he adheres to, he subscribes to Westminster Confession, chapter six, paragraph four. Utterly indisposed, we just quoted. Utterly indisposed, all good. Utterly disabled, all good. Made opposite, all good. And holy inclined, all evil. He can, he can nominally assent to that and, and still not believe it. But if a person believes, get this straight. If a person believes in Westminster Confession, chapter 6, paragraph, he is a Christian. Because Tulip is the gospel, and the first point, the T in tulip. It's not a coincidence that it's spelled T-U-L-I-P and the first letter is T. That's why we deal with T first, because 
of the order, being a necessary order. Last week, in Bible study, I, I discovered that we're not clear enough about the relationship between the five points. Why is this important? Because doctrine is not an amalgamation of individual parts. I remember this was this is these these things that we do in life uh, are all so m most of them are so are so such clear pictures of spiritual truth as we've mentioned again. And again. I used to go to a, a junkyard when something would go bad on my car. And like for instance, um, one time my, uh, what do they call that? The, uh, your air condition, my compressor went out. So I go to the junkyard and I say, I need a compressor. And what does he say? Okay, I'll give you one. <laughs> no, uh-uh. You got to give him the make, right? The Honda, the model, Odyssey, and the year. All three. Now, there were, there were three years within which that particular make and model, I could take parts off of that car for the most part because they didn't change the, 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 the car in those three years. But you see, it wasn't just a car. It was a specific. It was, it was a body. It was a certain car. And this is what, exactly what we're talking about. And so... Think about this. If you, if you had never, try to conceive, if you never saw a body before and you just saw an arm, you wouldn't know what in the world that goes to. But because you've seen a body before, you know where it goes. And so we call this, uh, Thomas Watson called it body of divinity. Theology is a body. The gospel is a message. It's not just individual parts that we're declaring. We constantly try to get everyone to see the relationship of these one to the other. Calvinists used to say this. Of course, they don't anymore because we, we've deteriorated so far. They don't even mention it, but they used to say this. The most influential evangelical evangelist of the 20th century, they used to ask this question. Can a person be saved at one of his crusades? And their answer was, Calvinist's answer was almost always Yes. And here was their reasoning. Because a person can hear enough of truth at, the, at his crusades to believe the gospel and be saved thereby. Which is to totally miss the point we're trying to make. Because when this person, whenever this person, this most influential 21st, 20th century evangelist, whenever he preached, of course he preached the false gospel, when he, whenever he preached, he didn't just mention things like, sal terms like salvation, Redemption, justification, repentance. No, all of these terms were mentioned in a specific context. You see it? So no, a person can't be saved through listening to his prophet because what he preached was a certain message. And his message, all of these terms were preached in a specific context. And the message was antithetical to the gospel. So, let's review this one more time. The gospel starts with total depravity. And you must be correct. You must have a correct understanding of total depravity because that is the condition from which you are saved. You can't believe in salvation if you don't believe in the state from which you have been saved. Total depravity. Once a person understands that he is completely and utterly wicked, then at one and the same time, what we're doing now is we're, we're explaining how these five doctrines are really one doctrine, how they all fit together, how it's a message, how it's a body of divinity. Once a person understands that he is utterly and completely wicked he understands at one and the same time that if he's to be saved it has to be from without himself which is the essence of election do you see it 
Those two are right together to begin with. Once you see that you can perform none of that which God demands of you, you can come up with none of it, then if you're to be saved, you can't possibly have any participation in it. That's the essence of election. Unconditional election. And then, once you realize what election is, which Deuteronomy, if you have to listen to this sermon again until you get this, this complete understanding of how the gospel is a body of divinity. Just as when you go to the junkyard, I want a compressor. You've got to tell them which one. Because it belongs to a certain system. What is election? Deuteronomy 7.7. 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you or choose you. It equates election with love. Unconditional election means this. God has determined. Once you see that you must be saved from without yourself. Because of your total depravity. Then the idea, then you have a real problem. Because what you're believing when you believe in unconditional election, you're believing in the love of God that he's decided from eternity to place his love on certain individuals. But then you realize what? He can't possibly elect me. He can't possibly place his love. I'm the exact opposite of what he loves. You see that? Huge problem you have, which leads you to the third point. That Christ comes, therefore, see, I'm totally depraved, therefore, I must believe in election. I believe that God has set his love upon certain people, but I'm, by nature, the opposite of that which he loves. Therefore, Christ comes to make God the Father's love consistent with his justice. You see how it fits together? He makes it so that God can love me and not violate his justice. Which leads to the next huge problem. Though Christ has come, and for certain people, all that the Father elected, He has caused His election to be consistent with His justice. But I, as I'm born into the world, I'm born a totally depraved person. I'm born consumed with this idea that I'm basically a good person. Consumed with it. I will not. Which is to say, what did Christ do? He worked out a perfect righteousness on behalf of all that the Father elected. But you're born consumed with the idea that you're a righteous person, which means you will never believe in Christ. See that? See the hopelessness of your state. See that you will never, not only will you never believe that you're totally depraved, not only will you never believe that God only elects, places his love on certain, because you think he deserves to, you deserve his love. Not only will you never believe that Christ has worked out a perfect righteousness on certain people's behalf, because you believe the death of Christ gives you value. The fourth point. You will never believe in the work of the irresistible grace because you are consumed with this idea of self-righteousness and he causes us to see our necessity. He works faith in us, overcoming this belief that you're basically a good person, causing you to believe that your only hope is in the perfect righteousness of Christ because you have none. And so, irresistible grace. And so, since salvation, owing to our total depravity, is and must be of the Father's election, by the Son's redemption, and through the Spirit's regeneration, working faith in us, this salvation is and must be an everlasting salvation. That's the perseverance of the saints. You see all it all fits together. Just like one. It's one doctrine. That's why we say. It's doctrine of grace. Not doctrines. If you look in the King James. Every single time the word doctrine is plural. It refers to false doctrine. 
Why? Because the truth is a unity. The unity of truth. People say, oh, election's not the gospel. It most certainly is the gospel. It's the gospel from a certain vantage point. Irresistible grace is the gospel. As viewed from a certain vantage point. Today, we want to look at another aspect of Sam Samson. And that is the birth of Samson. And what you notice very quickly is that there's a similarity between Samson's birth and Isaac's birth. Similarity between Samson's birth and Jacob's birth. Similarity between Samson's birth and John the Baptist's birth. Samuel's birth. Maybe that's why I keep calling him Samuel. Because... What's the similarity? Their mothers were all barren. They could not conceive seed. And the importance of this. Look at Romans 9, 9. Phenomenal verse. At this time, God says, for this is the word of promise. This is the word of Abraham. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Most important. Because from a certain standpoint, Isaac's birth wasn't a miracle because it transpired through the normal process of any other birth. But not according to Romans 9.9. 9. It wasn't a miracle. It was a miracle. At this time I will come. And Sarah shall have a son. The yin and the yang, we said. The antithesis. Analysis. Antithesis. And this antithesis conceives faith. And in this, that's the natural realm. Okay, the antithesis between the yin and the yang, the man and the woman. The antithesis of a man as opposed to a woman coming together to produce seed. And so in the spiritual realm, same thing. No antithesis, no regeneration. No total depravity, no regeneration. You're not even tempted. I heard somebody say one time, the problem with the church today is that the church today doesn't even attempt to get people to fear God. Meditate on that. See that? There is no fear, with God with, uh, fear of God without... And, and, and Matthew 10, 28, look at it one more time. And fear not them, which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able and shall destroy both soul and body in hell. This man said the problem with the church today is not only does the church not fear God, the pastors are not even attempting to get people to fear God. It doesn't happen by accident. And so it is in the spiritual realm. Just as the natural realm. If you ask a person, on average, how, how often uh, are there conjugal relations before a child is conceived? That's a ridiculous question. Say in the spiritual realm. How, how many times on average must a person hear the gospel before he say ridiculous? Because on the one hand, no. It doesn't seem miraculous. Because people are saved through the gospel. So you preach the gospel and people get saved. But on the other hand, at this time will I come. God only comes insofar as the person being preached to is the elect. So in conclusion, what can we learn about faith? That's what we're talking about from Samson's birth. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Manoah and his wife, the yin and the yang, coming together. Just as physical life results from the yin and the yang, so does spiritual life result from the antithesis. The analysis and antithesis. In other words, faith is the product 
of antithesis, just as physical life is a product of antithesis. First of all, as we just said, faith is holistic, not baptistic and individualistic. And that's why we just spent all that time. You see it? These are not individual doctrines which can be separated one from the other. They go together as a body of divinity. It's all the same doctrine seen from different standpoints. Secondly, in this same point, under this first point of the antithetical nature of faith, as Samson's birth was a birth According to antithesis, firstly, I said faith is related to what it is. See that? Secondly, faith is not related to what it's not. In other words, we must not only say what total depravity is, but we must say what it isn't. It's not what Calvinists say it is. You're only affected in every area by sin. Unconditional election means God has placed his love on some people and not other people. What's the antithesis to that? That there is a sense in which God loves every... No. You deny the unconditional election. Limited atonement means just that. Have you ever noticed this? I hope you have. I brought it up before. Calvinists can almost always be counted on to say this. I'm not comfortable with the term limited atonement. Why aren't you comfortable with it? It's clear as clear can be. The atonement is limited to all that the Father gave the Son. Why would anybody be uncomfortable with that? Because they're uncomfortable with the doctrine. They want people to have a chance. They want the reprobate to have a chance to be saved. Irresistible grace is antithetical to the concept of, of a free offer. What do I mean by that? Think about it from this angle. God does, he said, because the free offer says, God actually desires, though he is elected from the foundation of the world, only some people and not other people, whenever the gospel is preached, he desires the salvation of everyone to whom it comes. But think about this. God doesn't even desire the salvation of the elect. He works it. He produces it. He procures it. You see the importance of that. And then Perseverance. We not only say what it is, we say what it isn't. And it isn't this. The perseverance of the saint. You persevere owing to zero cooperation from you. What you do is the result of sanctification and not the cause of it. You see that? What you do in obedience to God. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace. Whereby we are renewed in the whole, we are renewed, past tense, in the whole man after the image of God. And are enabled, past tense, more and more, to die in the sin and live in the right. Your obedience to God is the result of your sanctification, not the cause of it. I'm confident of this very thing, that he had, that hath begun a good work and you shall perfect it. It's the work of God. Secondly, with regard to Samson's birth, it tells us not only the antithesis, but that faith is... We're talking about faith. Samson's birth is a picture of the origin of faith. Faith is a miracle. Rachel and Leah. Leah was not barren, and yet the scripture tells us that it was God who opened her womb. Nothing is more common in evangelistic circles than the chair illustration. How does the chair illustration begin? Take notice. We're talking about faith. How does the chair illustration begin? It begins like this. Oh, faith? That's simple. Everybody's got faith. Which is the exact opposite of what we're talking about. Everybody, you take, you know, you, you had faith in that chair this morning. When you sat in that faith, in the chair, you had faith in it, that it was going to hold you up. Now, what you need to do, take that faith and exercise it on Jesus. See, everybody's got faith. No, it's the exact opposite. Faith is a miracle. Samson proves it. His mother couldn't conceive, but God came. 
and produce the conception. Thirdly, faith is covenantal. Think about this. Is it any coincidence that the faith that, 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 that Isaac had faith as well as a, a Isaac was produced by a mother who was barren. His mother had faith. He had faith. Is it a coincidence that Rebecca's faith was evidenced in Jacob's faith? That Samuel had faith as well as his mother Hannah? That Samson had faith as well as Manoah and his wife? And then finally, number three was faith is covenantal. Covenantal faith and then finally, Look at Judges 13, 18. We just read Judges 13. Wonderful word. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? And that word for secret is the same word that we see. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and, then his govern and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Same word. My name is Secret. This is a prophecy of Christ. And we believe that this was indeed a theophany. What is a theophany? A theophany is an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. So, how does this relate to faith? How does this relate to the text? How does it relate to us? The importance, once again, we emphasize this again and again and again. The importance of being under the sound of the preached word. Because conversion, just as in the case of Samson, conversion is the result of Christ's voice. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him? Not in whom. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? The indispensable nature. The indispensable ness of the voice of Christ. The word of Christ in salvation. Lastly, thankfulness. Samson's birth tells us that all of faith is a miracle. This doesn't mean you should be thankful because thankfulness also is a miracle. Got that? I said, oh, therefore, since salvation is all of God, you should be... No, 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 no. You missed it. You are thankful. Thankfulness is just as much a product of God as anything else. Any other aspect of salvation. So if you're not thankful, what does that mean? You're not a Christian. It's not complicated. The Christian is thankful that there are still people preaching the truth. He's thankful. He's thankful. Think about this one, which you rarely think of, do you not? He's thankful that he has the word of God in his language. He's thankful. Thirdly, he's thankful that the Westminster, if you thought about this before, he's thankful that the Westminster, have you ever thought of this? The Westminster Confession of Faith is not a translation. It was written in English. He's thankful. That he has this body of divinity set forth so clearly in this confession. He's thankful for the, key, the King James Version. Oh yeah, did you notice that this past week? The New American, most people say that's an excellent trend. The New American Standard Version says that the sinners deceive God. He's thankful for the authorized version. 
And lastly, he's thankful for fellowship. Yeah. It isn't an accident that we come together. It isn't an accident that we desire to be together. It's the fellowship. Second, let's, let's look at this. Let's close with this for 2 Corinthians 6.14. Have you memorized it? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this time together. We thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for this instance. Of faith in the person of Samson that we tend to think because we're by nature we're born in this world carnally minded and it takes a while to become more and more and more spiritually minded we tend to think that Samson's greatness was in his strength no it was in his weakness he understood it and we understand it if we've been given understanding so we thank you for this person. We thank you for what we can learn from him. We pray that that would cause us to learn what we can from him. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.